important thing what we do in day to day life. With these two words, to start his proceeding on LV systolic function, concept of wall motion abnormalities, evaluation of global LV function, basics of. Dr. Sanjay, it's all yours. Thank you very much for being part over here. And I'm really grateful that you are taking this session all the way from San Diego. This is a busy schedule. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rakesh Ji. Um, and thank you for those nice words. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to request everybody to again mute their mics because uh, I know it's the wrong time for you guys. It may be the best time for me because it's 9 a.m. here and it's 9.30 sleeping time for you guys. So I'm not going to stretch it too long, but I'll uh, please make sure that the mics are muted. Otherwise, those noises can actually cause a lot of uh, interference in the communication. So... Uh, uh, without much ado, I'd like to start on my presentation. You know, this is basically left ventricular systolic function evaluation. And I do believe that every one of us who is practicing cardiologist uh, would understand that LV systolic function is the most important thing to understand as far as uh, the assessment of heart failure or heart uh, status is concerned. Because uh, we know... Uh, Till today, we have hardly any drugs for preserved ejection fraction, only drugs for reduced ejection fraction. So that is one side of the story. The other side of the story is the commonest reason for heart disease today is coronary artery disease. And for which we do understand that rather than global LV systolic function, regional systolic functions are the most important ones. So I'm going to touch on these three aspects as the topic uh, displays the concept of wall motion abnormalities, which is very difficult and very important to understand. Evaluation of global left ventricular functions and the basics, a touch basis on the TDI instrument. I think uh, in subsequent lectures, this will be described in greater detail. So uh, the first thing is the regional wall motion abnormalities. And as uh, would uh, the name imply, the reason for why we have to discuss and understand this is we know we have coronaries of supplying ventricles, the blood uh, for their nutrition and their function. And we do understand that if you look at this carton here, this is the left main, the left anterior descending artery, the circumflex. I'm skipping the right coronary artery here. Suppose there is a lesion here, obstruction here. The flow in this particular area would jeopardize the remaining ventricle would continue to have good flow. So the effect of the reduction or the obstruction um, and reduction of blood flow would happen only in this particular segment. And the rest of the segments would actually be normal. So that is why it's important to understand which uh, segments are we talking about and why are we talking about those things. As we know, the ischemic cascade, the flow heterogeneity after the blockage, there would be metabolic alterations in this particular area, which leads to diastolic relaxation abnormality because of uh, the stiffness. Unfortunately, it's very non-specific, and that is why it's not yet in the armamentarium of our cardiologist to understand and evaluate as a part of ischemic process. But as soon as the dyssynergy or systolic dysfunction appears, it is easy to understand and mind it. It appears much before the pain or the ECG changes would happen. So that is why the sensitivity and specificity is high. Um, this is an example. This is the left ventricle, as you would understand. You can see the basal segments, the segments towards the mitral valve are contracting pretty well. But if you look at the apical area, it's hardly contracting, rather it's going away uh, in a systolic contraction as compared to the rest of the walls we are coming in. This is we call as a segmental or regional wall motion abnormality. That means the uh, abnormality of the contraction is limited to a particular region, not the complete left ventricular segments. Mind it, again, I'm going to focus on the left ventricle alone today, not the right ventricle, although it's an important uh, rather ignored ventricle and somebody is going to talk about the right ventricular functions down the line. But whenever we have a wall motion abnormalities like this, it is almost for sure that we are talking about ischemic heart disease until unless it is proved otherwise. Many a times we have uh, patchy myocarditis, sarcoidosis uh, and other issues 
where a particular segments become fibrotic and dysfunctional rather than the whole ventricle. But this is for given sake. If we find wall motion abnormalities like this, for sure it is a hallmark of ischemia and that is what we have to be diagnosing as. Um, let's go a little bit more detailed into it because this is important to understand how do we consider this is ischemic and not uh, um, fibrotic element of uh, patchy myocarditis or sarcoidosis. So for that sake, the whole of the left ventricle is being divided into certain segments and there have been three different models which have been given up. Uh, the first one and which we very commonly used in clinical practice is 16 segment scoring system. Uh, and there, there is another one which is 17 segments. So this is the 16 segment where the base is six segments, the mid segment is six segments and the apex is divided into four segments. The reason why it is happening is because apex is supplied by the tip of the LED for that particular matter and I'll discuss that and subsequently. Uh, when we're talking about uh, the um, 17 segments, this tip of the apex is considered to be a 17 segment. And most of us, when we are doing it, uh, the MRI or the speckle tracking or uh, the CT scan for that matter, they are habitual or thallium for that matter, they are habitual of dividing it into 18 segments because it's very difficult for them to understand different segments. So everything in that particular order is divided into six segments, six at the base, apex and middle regions. But I'm going to focus on the 16 segment which we are clinically using in the practical echocardio labs. Let's understand it a little bit better. So uh, the central uh, portion is the carton of short axis. The short axis, we will understand this is the right ventricular free wall and this is the left ventricular uh, walls where we have posterior inferior papillary muscle and anterior lateral papillary muscle. So when we place the transducer in the long axis view, the long axis cuts the ventricle in this particular dimension. That means it would cut a portion of the right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, they, we would see the right ventricular uh, outflow tract free wall. And then we'll see the anterior septum here. This is the left ventricular anterior septum. And this would be the posterior wall here. So mind it, whenever we are looking at the parasternal long axis view, we would look at the posterior wall here and the anterior septum. This is not to be confused with the septum because it is the anterior portion which is supplied commonly with the LED. And the posterior wall does not give rise to any of the papillary muscle head. Sometimes when we tilt the transduce a little bit, we can see the origin of papillary muscle and then it ceases to be posterior wall. It is then the inferior wall. The other segment is when we are putting the transducer to the apex, we are cutting the ventricle in this particular fashion. We will have the right ventricular free wall here. We will have the uh, septum, the posterior portion of the septum here, all the way through the base, mid and apical region and the lateral wall which gives rise to the papillary muscle. So we will have an origin of the papillary muscle seen here. This is the lateral wall, this is the septum area and the whole of the ventricle is divided into three segments and I will describe it later. The two chamber view, when the right ventricular ceases to uh, appear, we look at the inferior wall like this here and the anterior wall like this here. So this is inferior wall, uh, the inferior wall and the anterior wall and the inferior wall giving rise to the posterior anterior papillary muscle. So this is how we translate the segments as far as the long axis views translating from the short axis views. All these long axis views, whether it is, this is cartoon again, um, the, whether it is four chamber, two chamber or long axis view, is divided longitudinally into three parts. The middle portion is itemized by the presence of papillary muscle or the origin of papillary muscles. Distal to the papillary muscles is apex and the proximal to the papillary muscles is the basal segments to the uh, origin of the mitral valve. So this is the mitral valve, this is the first third, middle third and the apical third of uh, the left ventricular long axis. And the basal, in the fourth chamber view, as we understand from the previous diagram, uh, this is the septum and this is the lateral valve. The right ventricle would be somewhere here. So we would have the basal septum, mid septum, and apical septum. The lateral valve would again be basal lateral, middle lateral and apical lateral. The two chamber view is uh, encompassing the right inferior wall as well as the anterior wall. 
the basal, mid and apical inferior, basal, mid and apical anterior wall. On the other hand, the long axis view as we rightly understood is not showing the apical segments because apex just has the four segments, right? So this is the apical anterior, apical inferior, apical lateral and apical septum. But the long axis view because the apex is any which way is not visualized is basal anterior septum, mid anterior septum, basal posterior and mid posterior. Importance also is now to understand how do the segments vary with coronary distribution, which is also very important to understand. We know the left anterior descending artery originates from the left main and runs in the anterior AV groove, uh, 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 the anterior uh, interventricular groove. And this comes from the base, from the mitral valve level to the apex, and then it winds round all the way uh, from the base to the apex and winds round uh, all the way around the apex. So obviously it's not rocking science that it would supply all the segments on either side of its distribution. So when it runs in the interventricular groove, it would supply the anterior wall and the anterior septum all the way through. And when it winds around the apex, it would supply all the four segments of the apex. If you had the 17th segment, which is this particular segment, also is supplied by the LED. So LED would supply the apex, all four segments, apical lateral, apical septum, apical inferior, apical anterior. And in the parasite and long axis view and the two chamber view, the anterior walls, mid and basal, and anterior septum, mid and basal is also supplied by the LED. So if you look at the total 16 segments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight segments are supplied that means almost 50 to 55 percent of the left ventricle is supplied by the LED. Let's go to the circumflex. We know the circumflex comes out as another branch from the left uh, main, goes into the inter, uh, uh, sorry, AV groove from anterior side to the posterior side and sometimes gives rise to the posterior descending artery, which is less frequent. So I'll not go into that detail here. So for all practical purpose, as it, gives, it goes into the AV groove, it gives rise to OMs. The initial OMs would supply the lateral wall and the lateral, uh, later OMs would supply the posterior wall. So if you look at the uh, lateral wall, these are the early OMs or OM1s or um, sometimes OM2s, which are supplying the basal and mid-lateral. It is seen in the four chamber view. In the long axis view, the posterior wall, which is supplied by distal circumflex territory, is uh, basal posterior and mid posterior segment. If you look at the right coronary artery, it runs just like the LED runs in the anterior interventricular group. It runs, the PDA runs in the uh, posterior interventricular group, and a portion of the right coronary artery would run in the posterior AV group. But uh, this may be varying according to the dominance of the right coronary artery. However, the commonness uh, about 50% of people would have the PDA arising from the right coronary artery supplying the basal and mid posterior septum or the septum we call it and the basal and mid inferior walls. These are the supplies of the right coronary artery. So we can imagine that if you look at uh, the coronary anatomy, in the four chamber view, we have all the representation of three arteries. That means the apex supplied by the LED, the septum supplied by the right coronary or the PDA for that matter, and the um, lateral wall being supplied by the early part of the circumflex area. So it represents all of the three arteries. The nutshell of this would also be to look at a bull's eye plot. As I said, the apex uh, is uh, the four segments we know the apical anterior, apical uh, septum, um, apical inferior, and apical lateral. All those four segments. On the other hand, the basal segments are uh, the anterior wall, anterior septum, septum, mid, in, uh, inferior, posterior, and lateral. And same with the. Uh, again, Dr. Ishwar, Dr. Ishwar, can you mute your mic, please? Um, so you, you can look at the LED. LED is running from the basal segment to the inter interventricular group, winding down the apex, supplying all the segments around it. 
The circumflex is running in the AV groove, uh, giving the OMs, the initial OM supplying the lateral valve and the lateral later OM supplying the posterior wall. The right coronary artery, the PD running the posterior interventricular groove and in the AV groove running as uh, posterior left ventricular branches being given to the inferior wall. So inferior wall as well as uh, basal and mid septum is supplied by the right coronary artery. See, the third part about the wall motion abnormalities is how to quantify. Is it just qualitative or it is quantified some other way? Form? This is how we quantify the, uh, the wall motion abnormality. The normal is when there is 50% or more contraction uh, of the diastolic thickness increase in the systolic thickness. Uh, hypokinesis is when there is 20 to 50 percent thickening and akinesis is less than 20 percent thickening. Dyskinesis uh, is when there is actually instead of thickening, increasing in thickness during uh, systole, the segments actually thin out during uh, systole. And aneurysm is when the diastolic uh, thickness, diastolic deformity of the architecture of the ventricle uh, is there which is out pouching into the diastole as well. So this is what we give a score 1, 2, 3, 4 as we increase in the abnormality index 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 which means the higher the number the less is the viability in that particular segment. In 1, 2 and a part of 3 you can have viable segments but three, uh, 4 and 5 means totally non-viable and totally non-revascularizable uh, segments because of the fact that they are not going to benefit. On the other hand, there is an important thing, a practical tip here. Do you actually measure the wall thickness during systole and diastole? If you will have to do that, you will have to do that for all 16 segments um, for every patient which is going to be hugely time consuming and erroneous because the ventricle is still the echocardiogram is uh, showing just a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional or four-dimensional structure which is the heart uh, moving continuously in cystic and diastole. So you can change your uh, alma meters for about uh, for meters for that matter. The diastolic may be different part of the segment and the cystic should be a different part of the segment. So for that particular sake, the practical thing is not the normal definition is when you have looked at 200, 300, 400 normal uh, hearts, you will understand your eyes would be getting tuned to what is the normal amount of thickening of that particular segment. The hypokinesis is when the segment is seen to be thickening, there is a change in the systolic thickness or diastolic thickness towards the systole, but it's not normal or as compared to the other segments which are normal in other parts of the heart. Akinesis is because the eyes don't perceive less than 20% thickening as any change in thickness. So there is no perceptible difference in the systolic thickness. That is when we call as akinesis. And this kind of an erosion as I have already mentioned to you. So practically uh, what we have to understand the normal is when we see the thickening during systole is as we understand and expect for a normal ventricle or normal segments. Uh, hypokinesis is when the thickness is there, thickening is there, but it's less as compared to what we expect or what the other segments of the heart are doing. And akinesis when there is no perceptible thickening. Let's give some examples. Um, that would be more clear once we talk it over uh, in terms of some certain examples. So. When we talk about a, a report, a report should not just mention that there is presence or absence of systolic wall motion abnormality. We should be able to say, is it what is the severity? That means a normal a hypokinetic, akinetic, dyskinetic, or aneurysm, where there is a scarring because aneurysm means a lot of scar. Which vascular territory uh, we are talking about and I have uh, described that probably some examples we will discuss it out in, the, in uh, further big lecture. Um, how many vessels are involved? Uh, that means is it right coronary alone, left cord, left anterior descending or circumflex so that that also connotes the risks involved and also the outcomes of the patient. 
Let's look at this example. This is a parasitic long axis view, and we'll understand this is the basal anterior septum, not the septum, basal anterior septum. This portion is mid anterior septum. This one would be the posterior wall. That means basal posterior and mid posterior wall. Mind it, the parietal muscle is not seen to be originating, but is seen there. If you look at the contractility, this segment is seen to be thickening in systole pretty well, right? So this means this is a normal segment. And compare this contractility with this contractility. There is the endocardium is not seen here. So this is the only endocardium seen, and there is hardly any contractility. This is actually an akinetic, diskinetic segment. No contractility, no change in thickness is seen. In the post mid posterior also no segment in thickness is seen. So what we understand uh, in this parasitic long axis view that the anterior mid and anterior basal segments are normal, but the basal posterior and mid posterior segments are akinetic and thinned out. So this means this person might be having a circumflex territory infarct, which has led to scarring and a thinning out of those particular segments. The same patient, we have a four chamber view. We can look at this particular segment, which is basal septum, mid septum, and apical septum. You can look at the change in systole. It's pretty good thickening, pretty good thickening. This is the basal lateral, mid lateral, and apical lateral. If you look at the comparison to this thickening, this is thinned out as well as there is hardly any change. There is movement, but no change in systole. So this means, again, as the previous uh, uh, parasitic long is showed, the posterior wall, this shows the lateral wall, which also is the circumflex territory. So this means this patient had a normal uh, RC territory. This is right coronary artery territory. In the long axis view, parasitic long axis view short, showed the, circum, uh, the LED territory, which are normal. But this um, gentleman or person shows infarcted or scarred or thinned out a circumflex territory uh, from the very proximal origin. If you look at the two chamber view, this is the inferior wall and this is the anterior wall. You can look at the anterior wall, everything contracting well. The inferior wall is also contracting well. Inferior wall, again, the right coronary artery territory and uh, anterior wall is the LAD territory. So this person has isolated left circumflex artery involvement, which is infarcted, scarred, and also this particular person probably have an uh, osteal circumflex or proximal circumflex lesion, which is led to a myocardial infarction in the circumflex territory. Let's look at this example for that matter. Again, another parasitic long axis view, the posterior wall, basal, as well as mid posterior wall contracting pretty well. On the other hand, the basal anterior septum is thickening. There is definitely change in thickness, but this is hypokinetic. It's less as compared to this. That's why it is called as hypokinetic. The middle anterior septum, on the other hand, there is hardly any change in dimensions. No basal movement or uh, thickness change is there. So this is what we call as akinetic. So this person means anterior septum, mid anterior septum showing akinesia and basal anterior septum showing hypokinesia, which would mean this is an LED segment, LED territory. Hypokinesia of the basal anterior septum means the lesion is proximal LED and the basal anterior septum is actually supported by the collaterals from the uh, right coronary arteries and that is why it is only hypokinetic, but the lesion is proximal LED. So there are a few things which we also must understand when we're talking about the wall motion abnormalities. The first thing is that in this particular segment, this is a parasitic long axis view, the comment on the basal anterior septum is this is normal. Obviously, this is a very good contractility. The mid post, the basal posterior is hypocontractile as compared to this, it is contracting but less. But this particular segment is also contracting and less. So that means this is a circumflex territory which is involved and this is the LED segment. But if you comment on the mid anterior septum, some people would say this is hypokinetic. Some people would say this is akinetic. But the reason why it is akinetic is there is hardly any change in thickness. There is movement 
the segment is moving inside but there is no change in thickness if you just focus on this particular segment there is no change in the thickness and that is why it is akinetic and the reason why it is so is because of this hyperconductile basal anterior septum it is bringing the uh, septum inside with it and that is why even akinetic segment without any change in thickness the movement is still there and this is important for us to understand that movement could be passive could a dead dead segment could also move but the thickening is active and that is why it is very important for all of us to not focus on the movement alone but to look at active thickening for the assessment of viability so this is because of pull effect when the heart rates are very fast the noradrenergic drive also can increase the movements and this could be because of passive rotatory movement the squeezing movement on the other hand if you look at this short axis view very commonly people would say they and the septum area is hypokinetic but if you precisely look at the change in thickness the change of thickness in systole is normal it's only in the different phase because when the left ventricular free wall is moving the septum by that time has already contracted and this is a very important thing that there is thickening here but this movement seems to be restricted and very commonly we will say this is hypokinetic and if this is very importantly seen in left buccal branch block where the septal activation happens earlier as compared to the lateral wall and that is why very commonly we say hypokinetic septum but that actually is not there similarly the wpw as well as uh, pacing uh, left ventricular right ventricular pacing commonly uh, results into a similar kind of pattern and we should be cognizant of the fact that we are looking at thickening not the move <coughs> the other important thing very uh, if i ask this thing um, i mean and that is the problem with the webinars because i can't interact but if you look at this parasternal long axis view you are looking at basal anterior septum and mid anterior septum and this is basal posterior and mid posterior right on the other hand this is a four chamber view we are looking at the lateral wall basal mid and apical lateral and septum that is basal mid and apical septum but this is very wrong why because you are seeing the origin of the papillary muscle and that is what i was describing when we are uh, describing the change of short axis to the long axis very commonly if you see the origin of the papillary muscle this becomes inferior segment that means base mid inferior wall not the base uh, mid posterior wall and this is a this by be a different coronary artery territory and we may error in suggesting that this is a double vessel disease when it is actually a single vessel disease on the other hand uh, and this is a four chamber view we can see the opening of the aorta here if the aorta is started to open we have come to the anterior portion of the septum rather than the posterior portion of the septum so this becomes a, a led territory or basal anterior septum territory rather than the rc or the pd territory which is the posterior segment again this can cause lot of confusion so we have to be uh, looking at the landmarks the papillary muscles for that particular sake and the aortic openings and all before we comment on these segments otherwise we we'll continue to make errors here so uh, sometimes what can happen is that we may have a, a problematic apical view and if there is a problematic apical view look at the segments in the short axis and always confirm those segments before we comment on it another important uh, communication gap which is there is the fact that in this particular four chamber view this is the four chamber view the mitral valve tricuspid valve ra la right ventricle and the left ventricle the ejection fraction here seems to be pretty good 45ish 50% the basal uh, septum is fine the mid septum is fine the apical septum seems to be a little hypokinetic but the apical uh, lateral mid lateral and basal lateral absolutely fine the ejection fraction 45% compare it with this particular four chamber view where you can see the mitral uh, tricuspid valve right ventricle contracting valve right atrium left atrium and here you can see the basal lateral okay mid lateral hypokinetic apical lateral akinetic basal septum normal mid septum is hypokinetic and apical septum is akinetic so we have at least 
big area which is supplying the uh, supplied by the LED a kinetic in this particular patient and the ejection fraction would not be more than 20 percent can you imagine both these patients both these images four chamber views are of the same patient taken just three or four seconds apart just for the sake of presentation and this is very common mistake which we do especially when we are beginning echocardiogram and, and make a 20 percent ejection fraction just become 45 percent or 45 percent ejection fraction just becoming 20 percent and this is a common mistake the reason for that is if you look at the point here the the transducer is positioned not at the apex apex is somewhere here this is the two chamber view so the apex is somewhere here and the transducer is positioned here and this common mistake happens when we start the if you look at my chest here uh, in my photo you start the transducer in the parallel noise if you and go out and down to reach the apex the moment you get the four chamber view you say yeah i've got the four chamber view that's the mistake keep on going out and down out and down till you lose the heart and then come in just to gain the heart that is the time when you stop committing such kind of mistakes otherwise there would be no dependability on the echocardiographic report that this is 20 percent or 45 percent makes hell of a change in the outcome of the patient and the uh, survivorship of the patient so that is why we call and we have to be wary of foreshortening last but not the least is there are certain erogenous factors patient factors which we don't have any control on look at this septum all scarred calcified hardly any this scene uh, dr anchala you will have to mute yourself please uh, so you can't see so if you are not seeing these things please have a courage to say that you can't see the endocardium so that the better uh, uh, um, better uh, technique can be used either by transesophageal or contrast echocardiogram or uh, MRI for, for this thing. So you have to have the courage to say, I could not visualize. 5% of people, despite the best uh, um, mechanism, would not have a good window. And you will have the situations like this. Another thing about the wall motion abnormalities, we cannot diagnose the acute coronary syndrome on the basis of wall motion abnormalities. It is ischemic chest pain, elevated biomarkers, and PCV changes. Only on that. Echocardiogram can just help you to have an index of suspicion, but the diagnosis is not made on the basis of wall motion abnormalities because acute infarct and acute ischemia cannot be distinguished by echocardiogram alone. A quick word about uh, the assessment of global left ventricular systolic functions. I think this would have been mentioned to you earlier. Uh, we have given up uh, the uh, two-dimension uh, two views to assess the well wall sizes because a lot of problems can be in the M mode uh, because M mode would be like this. It would not cut the ventricle in this particular direction. So you have all exogenous uh, segments uh, assessment by M mode echocardiogram to give ejection fraction by Tipolo's method. Simpsons or Mothified Simpson method is the best one on 2D echocardiogram, especially two, uh, two uh, you know, planar view, where we have a four chamber and two chamber view. All the segments through the lung axis of the ventricle is cut into 20 segments. The disc volume is calculated and um, accumulated uh, to give you the volumes, and then the volumes can give you the ejection fraction. So it has to be a four chamber and a two chamber view for the diastolic and systolic views to get it. So uh, where important is we calculate the end diastolic. End diastolic is an end systole, both of them is during isovolumic con uh, contraction phase. As soon as the isovolumic contraction starts and the both valves close, that is the time we take uh, end diastolic volume. And when the, the aortic valve is just about to open, that is the time uh, 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 we take it and systole. Or close, that is we take it and systole. So that is why we have to take in both the things. And lastly, the largest ventricle and the frame are just after the mitral valve closure. Uh, the mitral valve has closed, the aortic valve has not opened. In end systole, the aortic valve has now just closed after the end of systole and the mitral valve has yet not opened. So these are all isovolumetric phases, both of them, 
and this is the smallest LV and this is the largest LV. So that is why we have to be watchful of that. A 3D echo also can give you the ejection fraction method. A word before I end uh, about the strain rate imaging for coronary artery disease. Strain rate understanding for the heart has actually led us to a lot of insights. Ventricle has a complex motion. Ventricle, obviously, the short axis seems to move in the, uh, in, short, in the contraction fashion, but there is always a longitudinal movement. The base, uh, the apex moves towards the base moves towards the apex. And also, it's very clearly understood that there is a rhythmic effect. The base counterclockwise and the uh, the apex clockwise, so that there is a rhythmic effect, rhythmic motion, just like uh, what we do when we are uh, nichoing the tolias and all those things to uh, rinse the water. So this is the rhythmic effect of the ventricle, which is not captured by just ejection fraction, and that is why these three complex movements can be assessed by the strain rate imaging. So this is why uh, we have to understand the strain rate imaging. What is speckle tracking? Speckle tracking is all these modern machines. Just like our fingerprints, we, uh, the machines can sense the fingerprints. Same way, the printing or the, uh, these, uh, the uh, machines can now have speckles which are seen as a micro uh, gray zones in the ventricle to be actually tracked during this history. So if this was an old location of that particular speckle, the new location has come here, there's a movement in both the directions. And this uh, difference in uh, change in the speckle is what leads us to understand whether there is a shortening or whether there is a lengthening. And that is what the machines today can identify and plot all the way through we can actually change to see the change in the speckles in the form of shortening during the phase of time and the whole ventricular volume change curves can be drawn also we can see the uh, segmental volumes uh, the segment changes all these six segments in this particular four chamber view can be plotted like this this is the uh, yellow one here in the septum basal septum and the blue one here uh, the uh, mid septum the apical green um, which is apical septum and the uh, purple, um, blue and the red in this particular session. So the contractility can be seen uh, in a particular fashion and we can understand that the, the contraction in the basal segments is later as compared to the earlier apical segments. So the contraction is apico-basal and that is also something which the ejection fraction does not capture. The same things can then be plotted into a bull's eye and you can see the red ones are good contractions, the uh, uh, pink ones are lesser and the white is the minimum contraction. And what we see is if you look at the change, relative change in the thickness during the Sisley, it's 20%. That 20% change is what we call as peak systolic strain. So all these six, 17 segments you can see here, the apical 17 segment, all these segments are, have their respective strains noted. Whatever is minus 20 or the value of minus 20 or above, that means uh, it is less than minus 20. And it, this is minus sign. So anything value which is less than minus 20 would be higher in value. Minus 22 is the best. These are all good uh, segments. But you can see there is some wall motion normality in the mid septum, basal septum, and all these basal areas. So this is something by way of which the longitudinal strain bullseye plot can give us a segmental wall motion normality as well. The current status is the advantage of global uh, longitudinal strain we have to understand that it is definitely reproducible. You just have to have recorded a good image and offline the machine can be giving us the calculations. This is normal range, which is definitely defined. Minus 20 or above is good. Minus 18 or below is definitely bad. And less than minus 16 has a very bad prognostic sign. It gives us the prognostic value. This advantage is earlier on about uh, uh, eight, 10 years back was that all the vendors, Philips had a different mechanism, uh, GE had a different mechanism, but now they have a common boiling point. All the vendors have uh, minimized the vendor dependent uh, variability and can be used widely now. 
The circumferential stain looks at the contractility and it's less documented today and the only value which is positive because the, with the systole, the uh, dimensions come down. So the value becomes positive. Uh, the radial strain is something which is uh, uh, these dimensions decreasing that is becoming a positive value as I said. Uh, let me end with this particular example. This is a patient where we have all the four views, the long axis view, the apical long axis view, uh, the four chamber view and two chamber view. You can see although the movement is very slow but uh, there is no segment uh, which is showing less movement. You can see this. The apical view is pretty good, the basal segment is pretty good and you can see that there is hardly any wall motion of normality. But if you look at the fact that the person did have recurrent angina and minimum exertion had angina on uh, clinical testing and normal ECG. At the apex, you can see the white spot. This is a patient where you could figure out the person did have an initial wall motion maladies which the naked eyes could not get but your longitudinal strain could get. So ladies and gentlemen, um, and strain rate imaging today is used in clinical practice for detection of ischemia as I have already described. It is also uh, for the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome especially longitudinal strain decreases and the diastolic stunning is there. Uh, unfortunately again as I said a uh, differentiation between acute infarct, acute ischemia is not there but acute coronary syndrome can definitely be distinguished. Transmurality of the infarction is predicted. Uh, risk of ventricular arrhythmias, the lower the GLS, the higher the risk of arrhythmia because higher the scarring and overall prognosis um, depending on GLS. So I am going to stop uh, sharing my screen here and I'll, uh, I hope I was able to communicate the matter uh, to the audience. I'm in here in San Diego to answer your questions. If you have, you can unmute yourself and ask me questions if you have. So, I don't see, uh, you have to unmute each one of you before you ask question. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, I, yes. did, I did not understand why left bundle branch block, there would be uh, movement without thickening. I, I didn't completely understand the concept. Very good. So for that particular sake, uh, you have to first understand the anatomy of left bundle branch. The left bundle branch is actually like a three prong structure. So this is the bundle of his here. Uh, the right bundle gives, takes away here uh, from the background and the left bundle is like three prongs. One is the septal twig, which initiate the septum. The second one is the left anterior hemifascicle uh, uh, and the uh, left posterior fascicle. Left posterior fascicle, left anterior fascicle and the septal twig. So usually uh, whenever the left bundle branch block happens, the left anterior and posterior fascicles are not functional. But the septal twig, which is very proximal from its origin, still supplies the current to the septum area which initiates the contraction first. Secondly, the right ventricle branch, the uh, right branch, right branch is normal which would initiate the contraction in the right ventricle and septum being also a part of the right ventricle contracts as a part of its right ventricular contraction uh, and moves forward. So the right ventricular contraction is preserved the septal twig uh, activity is preserved but the left anterior fascicle and the left posterior fascicle is not functioning and this is why uh, the uh, septum being a part of the right ventricle as well as the left ventricle also getting its direct uh, current from the septal twig contracts earlier and the because the left anterior and left posterior hemiblock is there, this uh, current reaches to the lateral wall, anterior wall, posterior wall from the right ventricular branch with a slow conduction. 
So there is a time gap between the septal activity and the lateral gall activity. This may be uh, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70 milliseconds, as much as that. And that's why we feel a difference. Thank you. So I uh, please ask me questions because I just have a few, uh, 10 more minutes to go because I have to uh, rush to my son's uh, graduation ceremony. Um, I see many names here. I do not know who are the doctors, who are the organizers. Uh, uh, sir, Rina, this side from Drop. Uh, yes. Yeah. You, sir? Uh, they are all delegates. Uh, anyone else ask to any question to from Dr. Sanjay Mittal, sir? Dr. Samrat uh, Madanaik. Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. A very nice presentation. Thank you for updating us. Sir, I had uh, one very small uh, query. Uh, when we calculate ejection fractions based on Simpson's method, is it, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the uh, ejection fractions which are calculated with the help of uh, GLS or the automated software, mm -hmm. are they as reliable as uh, compared to the Simpson's? And uh, what should we uh, rely upon, sir, while calculating this ejection fraction? You don't calculate ejection fraction by GLS. You calculate ejection fraction by modified Simpson's method. You can use uh, contrast imaging or whatever. The machine automatically tracks the endocardium, the whole endocardium, and then it actually it, it divides the whole length of the ventricle into 20 discs. Each disc is got a radius. So that radius it cal and thickness, it calculates the volume of each disc and summates them, 20 discs. So that would be diastolic 20 discs and systolic 20 discs. And that is why it actually uh, takes care of this shape of the ventricle and analyzes it separately. This same thing is done in two chamber view, in uh, three chamber view, and sometimes even in uh, apical long axis view to give us a three plane or two plane um, uh, summation of discs for that diastole and systole. So it is nothing to do with GLS. GLS is a totally different thing. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, in yeah, in segmental uh, motion abnormalities, sir. Uh, how to differentiate if patient has a reinfarction? Oh, okay. So uh, that is a loaded question. Uh, Umesh, thank you for asking. You know, uh, one thing which I tried to put it into my presentation and communicate, but I didn't want to stress on it because it would have confused you guys. I have been talking about wall diastolic thickness. If the diastolic thickness is less, less usually the diastolic thickness is 8 millimeters, 9 millimeters, 10 millimeters. Anything less than 6 millimeters diastolic thickness means that area is already scarred. The second way to detect the scarring is the fibrosis, that the fibrous tissue is more uh, having less water and that is why it would be more equilucent, equilucent and that is why it would appear more white. So if you have whiteness or if you have a thinning of the segment, this means it's an old time infarct. However, to answer your question, whether the infarct which has happened just uh, five days or 10 days or two weeks back and now it's infarcted again on that particular segment is very difficult to understand. And that is why in segmental wall motion abnormalities, we just plan our echocardiogram, we cannot detect it. The only way to detect is to have a, a fibro scan, MRI can, it can give us the dead tissue, a scar tissue, early dead tissue, scar tissue as early as five to seven days after the myocardial infarction. But in um, echocardiogram, <clears throat> it's very difficult to understand whether it was a previous infarct and now reinfarction. So uh, sometimes what has happened, if we look at the historical picture, the infarct happened in the anterior wall, which is now discarnatic or aneurysmal. And now the wall, fresh wall motion abnormality happening in the inferior wall, that may be a different territory and give you that example. But uh, if the infarction is within a span of a uh, two weeks period, it's very difficult to understand on echocardiogram, whether this is just uh, uh, ischemia, present infarct, previous ischemia and now infarct, or previous infarct and now ischemia. Um, contrast echo also have its own uh, limitations, but uh, sometimes it can uh, figure out uh, perfusion defects and with ball motion normalities. Anyone else to ask the question? Good evening, sir. Uh, yes. 
जय सिंह यस सर यस सर सर वी हैव सीन इन शॉर्ट एक्सेस व्यू सपोज दैट एंटीरियर वॉल्स इज अ हाइपोकानेटिक then how we will write anterior wall segmentic is hypocanetic hypocanetic or uh, anterior wall hypocanetic very good so uh, as i said uh, short axis view has three different levels it is a basal level that means before the papillary muscle towards the mitral valve a mid level at the level of papillary muscle that means you are in the short axis view you looking at the papillary muscles itself and the apex view which is distal to the uh, um, the papillary muscle origin so on the single apical uh, short axis view you should not comment on the interior uh, segments you can just can uh, uh, submit that in that particular short axis view if you are seeing the papillary muscles that means you are talking of mid if your t is seeing the mitral valve opening and closing you are talking about the basal segments and if you are not seeing either the papillary muscle or the mitral valve opening at towards the tip of the apex you are seeing apical segments so what you do is if you are talking about anterior uh, wall look at which seg- which part of the short axis is it and then rank that anterior wall in that particular segmental side so anterior wall becomes basal if you are looking at the mitral valve opening and closing it becomes mid if you are looking at the papillary muscle uh, anterior and posterior anterior and inferior papillary muscle or if it, none of those things are seen then it is apical is that clear yes sir sir is there uh, no role in a three chamber view for uh, rwma there is the three chamber view is just like a parasitic long axis view but you refrain and to comment on the apical segments in that particular view because there is no definition according to the long axis views uh, apical long axis view apical long axis view is just translation of the long axis view parasitic long axis view to the apical region you would be seeing the same segments sir sometime uh, due to bony cage there uh, in a long axis view in posterior wall area uh, there uh, how can how will we will differentiate whether this is bony cage or this is a scarred in long axis view so bony cage is a very difficult uh, very easy to understand because bony cage you would not see anything bones are all white you don't see anything beyond that right the cage is something if you are putting your uh, transducer at the uh, apex in the uh, between the ribs and you are seeing the artifacts you call it artifacts bony cage is not seen not uh, sure so yes sir i would like to say artifact then how we will differentiate whether it is scarred or uh, it is artifact no 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 artifact is when you see nothing artifact is when you see nothing inside so you always uh, that is what we say that echocardiography is an extension of clinical examination if you are seeing something in particular one view always you compare it with the other views so that's what i was trying to show you one of the slides if you are seeing something in the apical view or apical view is not good the lingula which is usually uh, devoid of any lung tissue would be showing you uh, short axis or long axis views and you actually look at those segments in that particular view and reconfirm whether these two rhyme or not you understand what i'm trying to say yes sir yes i got it. thank you sir anybody else dr ishwar dr ishwar you have something yes. to yes sir so no questions at present thank you uh, i hear i see a hand raised by hero mr 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 hero dr hero you are asking something yeah so did he type anything no dr hero you you have raised your hand you, you have some question for yes you are Uh, sir uh, i have some query sir uh, first of all uh, sometimes during uh, doing echo uh, there is a global hypokinesia of all the segment mm-hmm. uh, in that time uh, what we will say whether it is due to dilated cardiomyopathy or ischemic cardiomyopathy is there any point to differentiate between them wonderful question thank you doc uh, for asking this question dr i mean 
So uh, when there is a global hypocondriacy, all the segments equally hypochondriacal, you cannot make the diagnosis of ischemic heart disease on the basis of that. But on the same pretext, just like I said, you cannot you the, it's the presence of wall motion abnormalities, a hallmark of ischemia, but not diagnostic until unless you prove it. Um, and same way, dilated cardiomyopathy, we would rank it as a dilated cardiomyopathy. When we do an angiogram or we do a stress echocardiogram, sometimes uh, dobutamine stress or exercise echocardiogram, those segments which are ischemic and producing hypokinesia at rest, when we put them on stress, those segments may become akinetic. So that is why dobutamine stress echocardiogram can actually have two phases. One, the initial phase, there would be improvement or increase in contractility because of adrenergic drive and in the later phase those segments would become akinetic or hypokinetic so this is a biphasic improvement first and then deterioration this biphasic response can be a hallmark of ischemia specifically when you have a doubt specifically in hypokinetic or sometimes even in akinetic segments on the other pretext whenever we are dealing with a situation with global hypokinesia our diagnosis is dilated cardiomyopathy we evaluate the causes because a triple vessel disease could be a cause of dilated cardiomyopathy but also be treatable. So we, as a matter of principle, whenever there are other risk factors, we do an angiogram to rule out uh, coronary uh, involvement and correct them. But your point is very well taken. You cannot diagnose ischemic heart disease on planar echo. But if you put that person on dobutamine stress, you can find a dual uh, improvement and then deterioration. This may be hallmark of ischemia. So, so uh, sir, what should be we uh, comment on the ECHO report? So, e the ECHO report, the planar ECHO report would say uh, the global hypokinesia is there, a suggestive or dilated cardiomyopathy. It is for the clinician to actually evaluate subsequently and uh, confirm the diagnosis of uh, ischemia or not. So, that is a clinical cardiologist job. If you are also happening to be the clinical cardiologist, you should always put them to dobutamine stress echo. Uh, uh, or uh, a coronary angiogram or CT angiogram to confirm whether there is a coronary involvement or not. We'll make okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? So uh, I hope that you would uh, you would all have understood what I have tried to communicate. Um, I am quite sure you may have had some problems. I am quite sure if you have questions which may come or crop up down the line, Dr. Rakesh is going to be able to answer those questions for you. Unfortunately, he had to leave for his uh, particular uh, family reasons. Um, and uh, if you have no more questions, I'll uh, thank you all for patient hearing. Uh, hope it was fruitful for you all guys. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir, for your all time thank support. You, sir. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.